Well, tonight we're going to cover the compromised church from Pergamos. And I think that we need to take an enlightened view of all of the different churches that are in the world. What I mean by that is we used to think that we were so special because of all the knowledge that we had. Well, that knowledge is good, but there's a responsibility that comes with it. You're supposed to perform. (laughs) We used to take a dim view of some of the other religious organizations. And that, I think, is a common thing among some churches. Not all, but some churches have the same kind of idea that they have better knowledge than others. They view others dimly. They persecute others. For example, there were a bunch of churches up in Minnesota that really pushed with the deprogramming things to try to thwart our ministry, the former ministry, because they thought we were from the devil, which we are not. But And everybody thinks each other is a heretic. Everybody says, all oh, that church is from the devil. Well, we have seen so far in these different churches that we're looking at that even in the dead church, there were still some who were worthy, right? Mm-hmm. And we have that on the authority of Jesus Christ saying that. That's what's so cool about this this whole section here in Revelation 2 and 3 because the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, and the Sermon in the Valley were Jesus talking to the Jews, right? They were in the uh, Jewish congregation at that time. However, the Sermon from Heaven in Revelation 2 and 3 is Jesus talking to us. He's talking to the church. So it's a really different angle than what most people have understood from Revelation 2 and 3. People have thought, oh, it's people in the future. Oh, it's symbolic. See, But no, Jesus is actually talking to us Christians, and he's telling us that there's different types of churches, and he is working in every one of them. He is in the midst of of the seven golden candlesticks. So, I think this is a really unique kind of way of looking at it. I don't know if other people have looked at it that way or not. I have a number of books that I have ordered and read on Revelation 2 and 3 from various authors. Also, I've looked on archive.org for older books that you can download for free. Uh, there was a book around 1920 that was very comprehensive. So uh, I think that what this approach will do for anyone who has an open mind, it will really bless them no matter what church they are in. Because I think that what makes my approach unique is I understand Jesus' teaching style because I looked at the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, and the Sermon in the Valley objectively. A lot of people have written a lot of wonderful things about those sermons, and they blessed a lot of people. Although most of their approach has been subjective, where they they saw something, they really blessed them, and then they wrote on it. And that's good, because many people have gotten born again. They've fallen in love with the Lord based upon that material. Mine is a little bit different because mine is from an objective standpoint. I think I understand Jesus' teaching style. Now, some might say that's a big fat claim. (laughs) But I have found some patterns in the first three sermons that are also in this fourth one, the Sermon from Heaven. These are, Jesus' concepts are profoundly deep. I mean, they're extremely well thought through to the point where even the sequence is right. For example, in the Beatitudes, the numerics 
are right. In the Lord's Prayer, the numerics are right. Now, whenever you have a list, sometimes the numerics are intended to have significance. Other times, they're not. So, it all depends upon the intent of the author. And, you know, if the author intended there to be significance, you'll be able to tell. I, I do my, my sniff test, I call it, where I check the fifth one. And if the fifth one has anything to do with grace or favor, then it passes that test. Then I try the fourth one to see if it has something to do with the world, the sixth one to see if it has something to do with man, etc. See, and if there is numeric significance, it'll it'll come out right away. You don't have to squeeze it. If you do have to squeeze it to try to get numeric significance then I don't think that the writer intended it. Because it, it'll be obvious, I think. But Jesus' stuff was so deep and thought through that there's layers to it. The passages and verses and the words can be viewed from different perspectives. Another trait of his teaching style is he employs structural elements like in Proverbs. So you have correspondence and you have contrast in the form of either alternation or introversion. So A, B, A, B, alternation, or A, B, B, A, introversion. Sometimes it's A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. There's sometimes more than two elements. But in Proverbs... If, when you run into one of those structures, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to puzzle your way through it, think your way through it by comparing and contrasting the sets of A's and the sets of B's. And by doing that, by meditating on that, by thinking more deeply, pondering on it, you can extract deeper truths. It's like playing one against the other or alongside of each other. That's a totally different way of thinking and teaching than what we're used to. It's Semitic. What we're used to is in our schools, they trot out all the answers and then they reward those who are able to regurgitate the information, who are able to memorize it. But we don't necessarily understand it. You have people who have taken all these courses and they go out into the world and they fail because they haven't applied it. The Semitic method is where you have to apply it. You have to work for the wisdom that you receive. That's another trait that Jesus has in his teachings. Another thing is that he will leave clues for what the right interpretation is. Again, we expect things according to the Aristotelian method of thinking and the scientific method. We expect to put something in the test tube and put it through a bunch of tests and every time you put it in the test tube, it comes out the same. So we expect then that when we test something in the Word that each paragraph on the subject will have the same sets of clues in it that will all fit. They'll be reproducible. And that's not the Semitic method. Because what Jesus did is he'll list four, five, six principles. And in one of them, he will leave breadcrumbs to what the clue is. And so then if you pick up on the breadcrumbs and follow his clue, then you'll understand one of those in that set, and then you apply the same understanding to the rest. That's very interesting. But once you follow the breadcrumbs and see it and then apply it, oh, it makes so much sense. An example of that is in Matthew chapter 5. Go to Matthew chapter 5. This is in the, the third section of the Sermon on the Mount where it is in the you heard it's been said but I say to you portion and there's six of those you heard it been said but I say to you 
And the first one is the one with the breadcrumbs. And it sets up the pattern for all the rest. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, he said, You heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember your brother has aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, and be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, there are clues. There's breadcrumbs in there. And many times, the breadcrumb will be a figure of speech, or it will be a repeated word. In this case, the breadcrumb, the clue, is the word brother. Brother is repeated Throughout, So there's an issue with the brothers in this section. And he says, you know, it says you shouldn't kill. But also, you shouldn't have be angry with your brother without cause. And also, you shouldn't tell your brother Raka. Raka is an Aramaic word. And actually, it would be Raka. And it means spit. <laughs> it means... You're not worth spit. You're not worth anything. And it's a, it's one of those words where the, the word sounds like the sound. It's a, the figure of speech for that is called onomatopoeia. <laughs> Crash or bang. Those are similar words. So what the Pharisees were doing, they were getting angry with their brothers without cause. They were saying, you're so dumb. You're so raka. You're not worth nothing. And then... The third one is thou fool. Now, in our culture, we call people fools all the time. We call people stupid all the time. But in their culture, that was about the worst thing you could tell someone because they were a God-centered culture. And in that God-centered culture, people did what they did because they believed that their God told them to do it. So, if you called them a fool, you were calling their God a fool, too. Whoa, that's about the worst thing you could do in a God-centered culture, you see. So, the issue here was these Pharisees were abusing their brothers. And Jesus said, look, if you've got an issue with your brother, don't go to the temple all smiley face as if nothing happened, and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm offering my gift. So I'm going to be forgiven and not take care of the issue with your brother. How hypocritical, right? But what really sets it up is the thou shalt not kill. That is the letter of the law. And then the spirit of the law is the issue with the brothers. Do you see that? So if we're not supposed to kill people... Well, then, we shouldn't murder them with our words either. So, you see, it is setting up the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And then that idea is what persists through all the rest of that section 3 in all the rest of the you heard has been said, but I say to you sections. They are all dealing with various letter of the law versus spirit of the law. In the other ones, it doesn't have the clue as up front as in that first section. So Jesus left a breadcrumb there. Do you see? And then once you understand it, then you apply it. And that is a method, that's, that's a way that he teaches. So we can apply the same thing to Revelation 2 and 3. Now, there's another thing that he does. Later on in the... You heard it's been said, but I say to you thing. He says that we should love our enemies and that we should pray for them who despitefully use us. Now, that is 
for me, it was very difficult for me to understand that. I thought he was crazy because of my background. I covered that in one of my earlier teachings. But another thing that Jesus did there is he gave three examples. The one about walking the extra mile, the one about giving them your coat, and the one about turning the other cheek. Now, again, this is another technique that Jesus uses where sometimes he states a principle and then he gives example after example after example after example. He does that with the teaching on the hope where no man shall know and then he gives example after example after example after example illustrating, no, we're not going to know. There's just no way that anyone's going to know when the second coming and all of that other stuff is. It's a secret. Well, here, he gives three examples, and then he summarizes about overcoming evil with good. So those three examples, walking the extra mile, giving them your coat, and turning the other cheek, should not be separated from each other. They should be all treated together, because they're all illustrating the same thing. People who don't understand that, they treat them all separately. But when you have something like that, then you can do what is done in Proverbs with the A, B, B, A. You can play the examples against each other or alongside of each other to extract more depth. Okay? It's, that is another technique that he uses. So, we can use this same technique with Revelation 2 and 3, because Revelation 2 and 3, again, it is so deep, it is so profound. There are levels in it. So we can play the different levels against each other or alongside of each other to derive more content. What has happened in the past is that equally smart scholars have written wonderful treatises about Revelation 2 and 3, But it looks like what they have done is they've decided which one of the four approaches they want, and then they tear apart the other three, and they promote the one that they believe in. They write books about it, and they have teachings about it, and all this other stuff. Well, what's different, I think, in my approach, is I'm saying, they're all right. (laughs) Because they're all different perspectives of Revelation 2 and 3. Because that is, that's pure Jesus Christ. It is deep. It's profound. Even the names of the towns are amazing. How it all fits. It is just so deep. When we play the different parts against each other, when we take the different layers and compare and contrast them, we'll be able to extract things that ordinarily, when you read it face value, you might not be able to infer. So, for example, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, this is to the Pergamos church, to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things saith he who has the sharp sword with two edges. Why is it mentioned sharp sword with two edges? In verse 13, I know thy works, and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat or throne is. Why is he mentioned Satan's throne? Interesting. And you hold fast my name and have not denied my truth, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Ooh. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now see, here's a breadcrumb. Earlier it talked about the sharp sword with two edges. And here it's talking again about the sword of my mouth. So, I had told you in earlier teachings that 
the salutation statement where Jesus reveals some aspects of his lordship is important because it is related to the issues in that very church. And here we have, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So the sword is corresponding. There's another use of it there. Verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows save he that received it. Now, what I am proposing is that we can look at this in several ways. First of all, this really happened. This was a historical fact at the church in Pergamos. The bishop, or the leader of the church in Pergamos, one of them, his name was Antipas, and he was killed for his faith. It actually occurred. So there is factual information in here, what Jesus said to them, what he encouraged them to do. He had some reproof in here, etc. Now, but then there's another angle. The other angle is that this is a stage in the history of the church. Alright? This is the third stage. The first stage was the early church And then Ephesus fell away. They backslid. They needed to go back to their first love. And they didn't. The second stage was a little bit later on in the history of the church. Where the church was persecuted. And that ended at the Edict of Milan in 313 AD by Constantine who formally legalized Christianity and gave Christians certain rights and privileges. Then the third stage was the compromised stage of Christianity, and that is where it was an unequally yoked marriage, Pergamos, between the church and the state. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then, of course, we get the Thyatiran church, which was later on in the Dark Ages, and then finally the dead church, the church of Sardis. So, we need to look at this section here as the marriage of the church and the state and the things that occurred there. You see, if you look at it that way, then it actually reveals the strategy of Satan's attack. And also, it reveals a strategy of the Lord to counter it. So you have the Ephesus church. What happened to the Ephesus church? Well, the adversary tried to infiltrate it. The adversary tried to take over the church by sending false apostles because that's the most efficient way of countering an organization is if you can take it down from the top. You see, when we're standing, we expect to have flack from the world. So, if the world calls us bad names, well, that's the world. We're used to that. However, if a fellow believer attacks you, that hurts, right? Because you don't expect it. And it's even worse if that is a leader in the church if they lead you astray. So the adversary is very efficient. He, he wants to be as efficient as possible, and so he'll try to take things down from the top down. So that's what he tried with the Ephesus church, and it didn't work because they found them to be liars. So then what happened? The next thing that happened is the Smyrna church. Because he could not attack from within, then he attacked from without. He mounted persecution against the Smyrna church. That backfired because some of the believers heroically resisted even to the degree that they died for their faith 
And those martyrs inspired the church. It also unified the church because everyone had to be serious about their faith. There was no lukewarm Christians in the persecuted church. So his pressure backfired. So now the third attack was in the Pergamus church. And that is when Constantine formally legalized Christianity and suddenly the pressure was off. But they paid a price for that because he ended the persecution. But he as emperor would have a say in church affairs. Uh, They call that Cesaro Popism. (laughs) That's a term I saw on the internet. Interesting. It's a monarchical control over Christianity where the bishops owed their positions to Constantine. What happened was now the adversary had succeeded in infiltrating the church and controlling it. You see, what was the one thing that the adversary hates the most about Christians? Do you have any idea what that might be? What he hates the most about Christians? Peter, do you have any suggestions? Uh, you know, the word independence seems to come to my mind. They're, they're you know, they're their own people. They're, they're spunky. Yeah. Okay, they, they're, they're good people. They fight against wrong. But what spiritually really gets him? Do you know? What's the one thing that he regrets the most about the crucifixion? He didn't know what was going to happen three exactly days, three days later. Well, he anticipated that Jesus would rise again from the dead. Yeah, but the, the day of Pentecost, he didn't exactly. He didn't know about that. And what was the thing that had he known he would not have crucified Jesus? Christ in us. Exactly. Yeah. The great mystery, right? That we got spirit back because right. that was his enemy. That was what could defeat him. Exactly. Yeah. He had just one Jesus to contend with when Jesus was here upon earth. Now, obviously, he wasn't going to win. Because how can you win against God? God created the adversary. So, the adversary is never going to defeat God. Also, God has foreknowledge. And the adversary, he he's really smart, but he only has three knowledge. <laughs> he always comes up short. So, he's always going to lose. So, his... His loser mentality is to take as many people with him as he can. But, now, trying to analyze insanity, you really can't do that. But that's the closest I can come to. So, anyway, he only had to deal with one Jesus when Jesus was here. He knew that he was going to lose. It was prophesied, right? But he didn't know the mystery. Because now, instead of just one Jesus... There's Christ in you, and Christ in you, and Christ in you, and Christ in you. What are you going to do about that if you're the adversary? I'm going to make sure you don't learn about it. Right. I'm going to hide it from you. And that's exactly what happened. Within a decade, all Asia had left Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Paul was the one to whom the mystery was given to make it known. And within a decade of the height of the church... In Acts 19, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. How did that happen? Because it was Christ in you, and Christ in you, and Christ in you, and Christ in you. Within a decade of that, all Asia had left him. And what happened? Well, they brought in all these other doctrines that are listed in Second Timothy, right? So, he buried the great mystery. And then, to make sure that it didn't come back, He tried to take over the church. See? These are the stages. He tried to send in false apostles. That didn't work. He tried persecution. That didn't work. But see, then he good copped, bad copped them. Because when the persecution was lifted, they were glad that it was lifted, but they accepted the deal from Constantine. Do you see how that worked? So he got his influence that he needed because his goal was Sardis. 
he wanted to kill the church. But the church is a thing of God, and it's it's hard to kill it <laughs> because it's spiritual. Okay, and God is there working, and Jesus Christ is working, and the angels are working. You just can't come in and do it. So, but he had a plan to infiltrate, and that's what happened with Constantine. Constantine even tried to use Christianity as a force to unify the empire. He used the church as another arm of control. And that's the main issue that we're going to see here, is this compromised church was a church in which the control was in the hands of the adversary. It's another arm of control, where the church and the state were working for the Roman Empire. Uh, Constantine even arbitrated in doctrinal disputes. The most famous one was the doctrine of the Trinity between Arius and Athanasius. At the Council of Nicaea, Constantine paid for everyone's way to get to the Council of Nicaea, but the bishops from the east had come had to come in over land, which takes a lot longer. But the bishops from the west could come by sea, because Nicaea was near a port. So it actually occurred that the western bishops had gotten there, and they convened when they had enough, but they didn't have a bunch of the uh, bishops from the east. And the bishops from the east did not believe in the Trinity, but the bishops from the west did, because they were affected. One of the other things that occurred that I didn't mention was that when Christianity was legalized, it was flooded with pagans that converted to Christianity. Well, when you convert to Christianity, I don't care where you come from, you still bring some bad habits with you, right? You still bring some ideas with you from prior involvement. And it takes a while, it takes a lot of good teaching to change that. Well, they didn't do that. They were overwhelmed with all of these pagan people in the church. And so, at the Council of Nicaea, Constantine himself proposed the official position regarding what they believed, and he rammed it through the approval process. And this was done before many of the bishops traveling over the land from the eastern part of the empire could arrive and have a say. So they'd already decided, and then when Arius and some of his followers refused to agree to what they had all decided, and you can imagine... Here are these bishops that owe their freedom now to the emperor, and the emperor is there in the meeting, and he proposes the solution. Now, what are you going to say to that? Are you going to argue with the emperor who has the power of life and death over you? Not only does he sign your paycheck, but he has the power of life and death too. It was really intimidating, I would think. But Arius and two of his followers refused to go along with it. So the bishops judged them, and they excommunicated them from the church. Well, then what Constantine did, he added his level to it by pronouncing civil judgment on them, and he banished them into exile. So they got the double whammy. They got excommunicated from the church religiously, and then civically, they got banished from the empire. This is where Constantine started to use the power of the government to enforce the beliefs in the church. A bad precedent. So he used secular power to establish doctrinal orthodoxy within Christianity. Another example of that was later on, there was a bunch of believers from North Africa who refused this influence from Constantine. So he had them all excommunicated and then he sent the army out and killed a bunch of them. So that set the precedent within the Christian church that followed ever since that if you really vehemently disagree with people, you have the right to declare them heretics, persecute them, and worse. That was all started 
with this marriage of the church and the state. So you see, it's all about control. See, there was a huge influx of pagan converts to Christianity, and that overwhelmed the church because they brought their pagan beliefs with them. For example, they observed a winter solstice festival, Saturnalia, and that was converted into Christmas. Then they also observed a spring fertility festival, and that was converted into Easter. So, And those still have pagan trappings today. Well, if the, our highest holy days still have a lot of pagan trappings to them, what does that say about the rest of Christianity? A lot of paganism came in at this time. Some of the things were addressed by the Protestant Reformation, and other things have not. Now, we look at, in that light, Revelation 2.12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things, things saith he who has the sharp sword with two edges. What is the sword? What is the sword? It's the word. The word of God. Right? But, this is a sharp sword with two edges. Okay? It's, it's sharp. It's not dull. It's precise. Right? It's accurate. And what verses does this bring to mind? Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. See, we're looking at this in light of the Lord's function in the compromised church, where there's a lot of paganism, a lot of wrong ideas coming in. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, the word is so precise, it is so sharp, it can pierce, it can divide between things that are really difficult to divide between soul and spirit. Right? So you see something happen. Well, is that spiritual? Or is that just from his mind? Or, joints and marrow. If you've ever studied that, you know that it merges the joint and the marrow. There's no clear dividing line. Another is the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's a doozy where we have to think in terms of way what our intents are and what our thoughts are. And the word of God is so precise that if you, if you rightly divide it, then you know what's right and what's wrong. So, in the climate of all of these pagan ideas coming into the church, what did they need to do? They needed to rightly divide the word, right? Mm -hmm. They needed to use the sword of the Spirit. Verse 13 in Hebrews is real good. Neither is there any creature that's not manifest. Any creature, spiritual and physical, that's not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, there's another verse that deals with the sword. Look at Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So, in this section, 
What does the sword of the Spirit do? It contends against evil, right? It contends against the wiles of the devil. It's part of our equipment to do that, right? It's against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, you had spiritual wickedness in a high place in the compromised church. The emperor. Isn't that amazing? So, the focus here, the lordship function of Jesus that is given in Revelation 2.12, he says, These things saith he who has the sharp sword with two edges. Now, what is Jesus going to do with that? Contend with evil. Right, he's going to help us fight the evil, right? If the people in that compromised church think of the Lord in that respect, that he was able to discern between truth and error, he spoke the truth. If they focus in on the words that he said, it will help them contend with the evil climate that they were in. Do you see how that fits? Isn't that amazing? They were contending with paganism. All these crazy ideas coming in, so they needed to rightly divide the word and fight it with the sword of the Spirit. You see? Now, we have been in a situation where we were persecuted. Now, we were persecuted by abusive leadership. All right? What is the reaction against that? Well, we resisted the control and the abuse, didn't we? And then we stood up and said something, and what happened? We got it communicated. We got kicked out. So now we're out, and some people have decided to throw the whole thing away. So there, there are some people who once were great believers, and they're living for the devil now. But there are a whole bunch of us that are trying to take a stand, because you know we realize that God didn't do those things to us. People did, who thought they were standing for God. As part of our catharsis that all of us have gone through, it's like a grieving period. There's a whole set of different stages that people go through. It's normal when this happens. Some people can go through it quickly. Other people, it takes longer. Well, can you yell at a wound and make it heal quicker? No. <laughs> no. You can't pressure healing. All you can do is you can make the conditions most conducive and let the body heal itself. Okay? There are some people who healed up real quick from the situation, and there are other people who are still hurting years later. Well, what can you do? The only thing you can do is make the conditions conducive for healing. You can't pressure them. You can't push them into getting healed. See? You can encourage them. You can pull them. (laughs) But you can't push them. See? You just have to be loving. But during that whole process, there's a, a re-evaluation of things. That's normal. There have been a lot of people who, in a reaction to the control and the abuse, have looked for things that are new, things that are different. See, because what was old hurt them. Do you see the reaction there? Now, but some of those old things were right. They were just associated with the abuse. So we have to prove all things, the word says, and we have to hold fast to that which is good. But what has happened sometimes is people have thrown out a few babies with the bathwater. <laughs> and they've, they've sought something new in the process. And I don't advocate getting new stuff for the sake of getting new stuff. Because the old stuff hurt us. No, we have to evaluate. And we have to honestly look at things. Yes, there were some things that people did, that the old ministry did, that were wrong. Alright? But, there are other things that are essential for the body of Christ to work. The body of Christ is a body. 
It is not an amoeba. One reaction to the hurt has been where people, they don't want to try to unify in any way because the structure hurt them. But you need to have some structure because, you know, if you have someone in your fellowship who is a really, has a great ministry, well, can you train them? Well, some of us can, yes. But what if they need more training that's beyond your capability? What if you're so busy doing your work to pay your bills and everything that you don't have time to really give them the justice that they need? Well, if you were in a in a larger, quote-unquote, organization, and there was a way to send people to someone else who was more qualified to train them, then that would be good. Because what happens after all of us get too old to set up chairs for fellowship? What if we can't set up the tables anymore? We're walking around in rocking chairs and canes and, and all of that. Well, who's going to set up the chairs? Well, you do need to have a legacy to pass on. I mean, we have a lot of wonderful things we've learned. Well, there there has to be a vehicle for that. So there is a need for some structure. Now, of course, not a stifling amount like what we experience. So we can learn from all of those mistakes and hold fast to that which is good. But you see... We're in the process of change like they were in the process of change in that stage of the church. Their process of change involved a lot of pagan ideas coming in that they had to evaluate and cut straight with the word, right? Our situation is there is a desire to bring in new things because the old things hurt us And the new things that are being brought in are from denominational Christianity, which may or may not be right. Right? So, you you, you get out on the internet and you look on the internet about what people believe, and the majority seems to say one thing. Well, does that make it right? No. You still have to rightly divide the word and say what the word says. See, and so it is a similar kind of situation. We need the sharp sword with both edges, okay? And then we fight the devil with it. Now, how do you fight the devil? Do you go up and punch him on the nose? No, you can't do that. He's spiritual. What is our weapon against the adversary? The Word of God, right? Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. When the tempter came to Jesus, he said, If, if, if you're the Son of God, command these stones that the, they may be made bread. Well, that right then was his greatest need because he had fasted for 40 days, right? But Jesus answered and said, what? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The adversary hit Jesus with his greatest shot. He knew Jesus was hungry, and he gave him his best shot. Well, Jesus gave the devil his best shot back. (laughs) And the best shot is the word of God. That's why I think in verse 12, that's really neat to see. We understand it in the light of the fact that the compromised church was compromised because the government and the church were combined into one. There was a lot of paganism. It was rampant. There was a lot of spiritual stuff happening. Wrong kind of spirit. And they needed to fight it with the sharp sword with two edges. And they needed to view the Lord Jesus Christ and look at his example, because we need to walk like he walked, right? Well, we need to rightly divide the word like he did. We need to speak the word like he did. We need to defeat the adversary like he did. And so, if we look at the accounts in the Gospels, 
of Jesus doing that and seeing how he did that, then we'll learn. Do you see how his lordship aspect is so appropriate there? Wow, I mean, that's really neat to see. Then it goes on to say, I know where you dwell, and I know where Satan's seat is. The word seat is throne. Pergamus had the largest number of pagan temples in Asia Minor. It was a petting zoo for devil spirits. <laughs> it also used to be the Roman capital of Asia Minor until Augustus Caesar moved it to Ephesus in 27 B.C., It still was one of the most influential cities in the Roman Empire. It had the second largest library in the world, no world at that time. Also, it was the home of a large healing center. One of the pagan gods was the god of healing, and a lot of people were attracted by that. That's where Satan's seat was. Also, one of the pagan temples was the temple of Zeus, And there was a huge altar with Zeus sitting on a throne. So this Satan's seat, I think, is talking about that, where he is the chief of the pagan pantheon. The next thing, I know you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith. Now, we covered that in the Philadelphian church. So I'm not going to cover that here. We don't have enough time. And then he talks about Antipas, who was his faithful martyr. Antipas, there's not much in recorded history that's provable history. There's a lot of tradition about Antipas. The tradition says that Antipas was both the leader of the church in Pergamos, and he also was a dentist in the healing center. They didn't have as sophisticated tools with dentistry as they do today, but they still had people who specialized in treating teeth. As a believer, he prayed for people and healed them. And because there were so many pagans in town, he cast out a lot of spirits. (laughs) And the pagan priests complained to the authorities that he was casting out so many spirits that the authorities came down on Antipas with the normal thing that they did, which was you have to pledge allegiance to the Roman Empire because you're, we question your motives, and part of that pledge of allegiance was to offer a pagan sacrifice, and Antipas refused, so they killed him. That's what happened there. Then it goes on that Jesus says that, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, it says thou hast there. So there were people inside the church that held this belief, this influence from Balaam. So there, the attack was internal. It came from regular believers in the church. And the reason for that is because there was such a huge influx of pagans into the church. That's what happened. They had the influence of Balaam. Now, this is something that I just, I did not know what it was. Because when you go out and look at all the the writings from the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, and you get into what people think that this doctrine of Balaam was, it's sort of like what we heard about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Yeah where people would say what Paul's thorn of the flesh was, it was their pet peeve. <laughs> and so you, you get all these different ideas of what Balaam's error was, the doctrine, it says, the doctrine of Balaam. And so you have all these different writings where people write about their pet peeves of what these different things were, but it says what they were. It says... <laughs> Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel? What does a stumbling block do? Makes you trip. Makes you fall. Makes you trip. Right? Now, this is a spiritual term. It causes you to sin. Right? A stumbling block is something that is put in your way. When you're stumbling, you're not walking. That's right. Right? You're falling. It's a spiritual term. 
And see, we have to think of this in terms of a pagan, devil-spirit-filled situation where there's a lot of temptations going on. You have all these people with all these crazy notions from paganism that have become Christians. They have all these superstitions. Like a common superstition we have is to not walk under a ladder. Right? Another common superstition we have is to not break a mirror. Another common superstition people have is to not let a black cat cross your path. Now, then, what are you supposed to do if one of those things happens? How do you counteract it? Well, you're supposed to throw salt over your shoulder. Right? 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 Okay. So now, all of those things, are those in the Bible? No. They all come from various pagan notions. And now this seems kind of silly, but I'm telling you common notions that we identify with. Well, they had a whole bunch of them that were all pagan back in that culture. They had become Christians, and they were still doing these things. They were still throwing salt over their shoulder instead of praying. They were giving credence to spiritual things that were not in the Bible. Well, what happens when you do that? You open up trap doors for the adversary, right? You give him cause. You give him entree into your life. See, the adversary is a bully. And if you go to a fortune teller and get advice, the adversary says, ah, You owe me something now because you went to one of my people and I gave you something. So I own you now. That is what the adversary, he's a bully. If you start dabbling in these spiritual things, he feels he has a piece of you. And what does the adversary do? He tries to get you to stumble. He tries to get you to fall. And the way that it works It's like a whirlwind. It's like a um, tag team wrestling. Some spirit comes in, tries to whack you on the head, and before you have a chance to recover, another one comes in and whacks you in a different direction, and pretty soon, if you don't stand up against it, you're going in a tizzy. You're going in a circle, and that is what the whirlwind was in the book of Job. One after another, after another, after another, trying to get you to go down the drain. That's what the adversary wants to do. That's all involved in the stumbling block concept. All right. Next thing is to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, what is that? And to commit fornication. Now, we think of committing fornication as the act of illicit sex, sex out of wedlock, etc. But we also know that this fornication is a spiritual term, right? It's a symbolic term where you become unequally yoked, like it says in 1 Corinthians 6, with evil. All right. So if the fornication has a symbolic connotation, why can't the eating unto idols have a symbolic connotation? You see, what happens to the stuff that you eat? It sustains you. It becomes part of you. So, this eat things sacrificed on the idols also can have a second idea to receive things from paganism into your thoughts, into your habits, into your life. Like, what you eat sustains your life. Now, I think, though, that the clearest way of understanding this stuff with Balaam is to look at the record about Balaam which I believe is in Numbers 22. Now, also, who who was Balaam? Balaam, I think, was sort of a a quasi-believer. He was not from the children of Israel. He was someone in the Levant area, Middle East, and his ideas about the true God would have come from Abraham through the Arabs, through all the other people, because there was a number of different peoples that were related to Abraham, right? And they believed in God. When Moses went into Midian and he met the priest of Midian, they believed in the true God. 
Now here, this incident here is after the 40 years of being in the wilderness. They had had the law for two generations, for 40 years. This guy, Balaam, he had not learned the law. He's sort of a a quasi-believer, I think. He was like a, a local soothsayer. Here is this Balaam guy. Numbers 22. One. And the children of Israel sent forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was sore afraid, and there were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. Verse 4. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. So he sent messengers, therefore, to Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor. You know where that is. Which is by the river of the land of the children of the people. To call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come forth out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Verse 6. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Now, so here's this Balaam guy. He has a reputation for blessing and cursing, right? Is that a normal reputation for a prophet? I don't think so. A prophet is someone who stands for the true God, who encourages people to stand upon the word, right? He fights against error. Now, if you are a pagan person and you want someone cursed, who do you go to? You wouldn't be a prophet, I guess. No, you wouldn't go to a prophet. You'd go to a witch, uh-huh. right? you uh-huh. go to an, ench- an enchanter, a wizard, a soothsayer. See, that's why I'm saying that this this Balaam guy is sort of an iffy guy. He's he's sort of a quasi believer kind of guy, okay? He's both sides. Yeah. He's an A C D C guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, he applies enchantments. We're gonna see this. Verse seven. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. Ooh there's some hooky pook words here. They came to Balaam and spake under the words of Balak. So this was payment. We're going to see in some of the other records that talk about Balaam that he was enticed by payment. Verse 8. He said to them, Lodge here this night, I'll bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent to me, saying, Behold, there's a people came out of Egypt, which covered the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Now, is that pretty clear? Yep. Uh-huh. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. So there you have the word of God. Verse 13. Balaam rose up in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuses to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Balaam rose up. They went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Yay! Now, if that is all that would have happened, it would have been great. But this Balaam guy wasn't quite legit. Balak, the king, sent again princes more. More honorable than they. Now, when it talked about Balaam in Revelation 2, in the context of the spiritual contest going on between these Christians that had just been released from persecution, and all of a sudden now there's got all these pagan people coming into their church, and they're trying to stay on top of all these pagan ideas, and pagan practices, and superstitions, and error, and all this other stuff, Temptation after temptation after temptation attacked Balaam in the same way. Verse 16. They came to Balaam and said, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor. Woo! I've doubled the bill. Okay. (laughs) 
and I will do whatsoever you say to me. Come therefore, I pray thee, and curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of my the Lord my God to do less or more. Yay! But wait a minute. It kept going. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here tonight, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. No, why? See, Balaam really wanted the rewards of divination. <laughs> he really wanted that payment. But he was bound by what God had told him. But he was trying whichever way, maybe, maybe God will change his mind. Okay, you see, what part of no do you not understand? God said, don't go with them. <laughs> but Balaam, he was trying. Verse 20. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. Verse 21. Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Wait a minute. The men did not come to call him. He just went. Do you see that? And verse 22, God's anger was kindled because he went. Well, he said, if the men come to call thee, then you can go. Well, obviously the men didn't come to call him. So the answer was still no. Yeah, the answer was still no. But he still, he wanted, he really wanted to go. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now, this shows a function of angels. They can marshal external circumstances. A lot of stuff that happens. Now, I'm not trying to say we worship angels. I'm giving the credit to God, because God told the angel what to do. But a lot of things that happen behind the scenes are done by angels. So he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants there were, were with him. Verse 23. And nobody saw the angel except the animal. The ass saw the angel. <laughs> Verse 23. The ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way, and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. And the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on one side, and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place, where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And then, verse 28, Balaam was so far out of fellowship, God had talked to him before, but evidently he was so out in left field, God couldn't talk to him in any other way than to open up the mouth of the ass. And she spoke. She said to Balaam, you know, Hee-haw, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam, matter-of-factly, he, he starts talking back to the, to the animal. Oh, this, is, this is so funny. Because thou hast mocked me, if I had a sword in my hand, I would kill thee. It's, it's one ass talking to the other. <laughs> and the ass said to Balaam, He have I not thine, which thou hast written ever since I was thine unto this day? He haw, did I ever do this unto thee? And he said, Nay. <laughs> so, who, who's talking like an ass now? <laughs> Oh, and so the donkey says, now you're talking my language. <laughs> then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand, because thy way was perverse before me. Balaam wanted that payment any way he could possibly get it. And then the angel says, And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. 
And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. Now, here, the princes of Balak are there, too, and his two servants. They probably did not see the angel. So what do they think, you know? This Balaam, this Balaam guy needs a new ass. His ass is out of whack. <laughs> this Balaam guy, you know, why does our king think so much of him? He's fallen out of his face, so not not only does he have a bad ass, he's uncoordinated too. <laughs> so, and the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, thou shalt thou speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto the city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, which is in the utmost coast. And Balak said to Balaam, Did I not earnestly send to you to call thee? Wherefore thou camest not unto me. Am I not able to promote thee to honor? So, you know, more enticement, more enticement, more temptation. And Balaam said to Balak, Lo, I'm come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts on my mouth, that shall I speak. So, and Balaam went to Balak, and they came to Kirjash Huzoth. You know where that is, right? Mm -hmm. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and said, and the princes were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him to the high place of Baal, to the temple, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. So it was on a high hill. And Balaam said to Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balaam and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand by the burnt offering, and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come and meet me, and whatsoever he shows me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. And God met Balaam, and he said to him, I have prepared seven altars. I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou speak. And he returned unto him and said, Lo, he stood by his burnt offerings and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done? I told you to curse him. And behold, you bless them all together. And he said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord has put in my mouth? So then what happens? Well, Balak says, Well, how, how about two out of three? How about two out of three? <laughs> Balak said to him, Come, I pray thee, with me to another part, another place from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and thou shalt not see them all. And curse me them from thence. And he brought him up to the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah, the another mountain, and built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said to Balak, Stand here behind, by your burnt offering, where I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say to him. When he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab there too. And Balak said to him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken to me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? And hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. And the prophecy about the Messiah coming from this, this funny guy, you know, this, this quasi-prophet guy. 
And and look what great word. God is not a man that he should lie. That verse, wow. Verse 22, God brought them out of Egypt. He has said, as it were, with the strength of a unicorn or rhinoceros. Look at verse 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Well, Balaam was an enchanter. Neither is any divination against Israel. Balaam was a diviner. That's what his trade was. According to the t- this time shall it be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift himself up as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he's eaten of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. And Balaam said to Balaam, don't say anything. Don't curse him. Don't bless him. Just don't say anything. <laughs> But Balaam answered and said, Balak, didn't I tell you what the Lord speaks? That must I do? And so then Balak said, well, how about three out of five? How about three out of five? (laughs) Temptation after temptation after temptation. Not taking what the word said. God said, don't go. Right? And now now God says, I'm blessing these people. I ain't going to curse them. But still, they wouldn't take the sharp sword and divide properly. See how appropriate it is? Isn't this neat? So he offered another set of offerings. Look at chapter 24, verse 1. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not at other times to seek for enchantments. But he set his face toward the wilderness. See? To seek for enchantments. What is that? Well, that was what he was not supposed to do. Tea leaves, mm-hmm. dowsing rod, yeah. Yeah. reading tarot cards, mm-hmm. reading palms, mm-hmm. some kind of a, a thing that would have a spiritual overtone. See, that's why I say this Balaam guy wasn't a real prophet like we think of a prophet. He was sort of a quasi-prophet guy. You know what? Later on, Joshua's army kills Balaam. Now, if he was a real prophet, would they have done that? No. This is really something to see. This is the doctrine of Balaam that it talked about in Revelation 2. Enchantments, divination, it's all about control. Controlling through prophecy. Because if you tell someone what to do, and you're a prophet, it, you exercise control. Look at Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Here it talks about Balaam again. They've forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Well, he did. He wanted to get that payment any way he could. Jude 11, Jude, verse 11. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. So you can see that there's gain here. What does the word say about gain? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness. What is the doctrine that's according to godliness? It's the great mystery. That's something out of the marvelous mystery tour class. Verse 4. If he's not according to that doctrine, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and stripes of words, where comes envy, strife, railings, evil, surmisings. Well, that is exactly what was going on in this church with all those pagan people who had come in. They were challenging what the believers were saying, asking questions, trying to draw parallels between what they had believed before in their pagan religion and Christianity. Getting into arguments, strifes of words, Verse 5, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Wow. If you look at corrupt leaders, 
in the church, what do they do? They gain from their people. They gain. They get riches. They get control. They demand favors. Now, there is nothing wrong being a leader and receiving financial support because, you know, you, you shouldn't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. And as a ministry grows, then there need to be certain people who have an adeptness that are full-time for that ministry so the ministry can grow, so they can minister. Sure, there's a lot of other lay people that are part-time and all of that. That's fine. It's okay for that to happen if they're not gain-minded. See, we're not in it for the money. We're in it for the service. And when people give... That helps. But you cannot. How can you minister to someone and try to figure out how to bless them if you're fighting off thoughts about how you can take advantage of them? Ooh. But see, let's say, here's a situation where you were a leader and some woman makes herself available to that leader in a sexual way. Well, you've got to take a stand and say no. You have to. Because if you do it once, what's going to happen? Every other woman that comes to you, you might have in the back of your mind what happened to the other situation. And you've got to fight that off. Well, how can you believe to heal someone, minister to someone, get revelation for someone, if you're fighting off thoughts like that? Gosh, you just cannot give in to that at all. You cannot give in to anything like that to gain from someone. That's in your congregation. Because if you give in to that, if you do that, then from then on, you're going to have to fight off thoughts in your mind about that situation. How terrible. So, never do it. God said no. What part of no do you not understand? <laughs> okay. but well, Let's ask him again, but a different way. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no. You just, you don't go there. So, supposing that gain is godliness, where you, you figure out how... There are ministers that, are, that have millions of dollars. What are you going to do with all of that? Some guy wants, wants people to buy a new jet for him. Yeah, fourth one. <laughs> oh, God! So, so he doesn't have to refuel. So he can go from A to B without refueling. Oh, he okay. has three other jets that can make the trip, but he's got to refuel oh. once. Well, that's just nuts. Boy, boy, what what I could do with that money? I mean, jeez. Well, God will take care of it. (laughs) Verse six: But godliness with contentment is great gain. That's that's it. For we brought nothing into this world, and certainly we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, yeah, that that's what drove Balaam, fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, in the, in the parable of the sower, the riches impeded those people that were in that category, and they did not bring forth fruit unto ripeness and to fruition. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. But the love of it is. It's the root of all evil. Why? Because with money you have power. With money you have control. The love of money is a gateway enticement. A gateway enticement. You know how people talk about certain drugs being a gateway drug Supposedly, if you if you partake of this drug, then things it'll be an entree into a lifestyle uh, full of drugs because it feels so good or whatever that you just get addicted. Love of money, that power there, is a gateway enticement. It is spiritual means of control, and that was what was happening in Pergamus with the emperor controlling the church and the adversary through the emperor controlling the church. But look what else. Acts 16. Acts 16. Verse 16. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of what? Divination. 
Divination. Divination. <laughs> Same thing that Balaam had. Do you know what the Greek word is for that? Puthanos. What word do you get from that in Greek into English? Is that python? Python. What does a python do? Kills people. How does it kill people? Oh. Is that the one that strangles? Yes, it squeezes the life out of them. And that's exactly what these diviners do. This woman was possessed with the spirit of divination, metis, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Balaam. He was a soothsayer. He was an enchanter. He was a prophet that was quasi, you know, he was like, some days he was on and some days he was off. Okay? And when people call those 1-900-yo-stupid <laughs> phone lines, what do they do? The diviners control their lives with prophecy. That's what they do. It's a gateway spirit. Because once they get the control in and get people to do certain things, then it opens the door for all kinds of other spiritual problems. It is going down the drain in the tag team fashion. One after another, bang, 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 round, 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 lower, 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 die. That's the plan. And that's what the adversary wants to do with the church. Get control, take it lower, 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 and kill it. Because the one thing he cannot stand is Christ in you. And we're going to see this even more vividly. So, this woman who had this spirit, verse 17, the same followed Paul and us crying, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who show us the way of salvation. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute, is that true? Yes. This spirit can function in a Christian context. Wow. Why? For control. It gives false predictions. It controls people. It does whatever it can to be in charge. It'll say anything. It'll do anything. Even speak the truth. But twist it, because you know what was going to happen is other people were going to say, oh, you're with them. And so then she would say, yes, I'm with them. And she would gain avenue into their lives to control them that way. Do you see it? So, And she did this for many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to her, Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul, Silas, and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. So, this was a method of control through divination, through enchantment. That's what the doctrine of Balaam was. And the pagan religions were full of these things. They controlled people through false prophecies. Got them all possessed. That's how the church fell during this time and became the compromised church. Now, the next thing is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is that? Well, whatever it is, it's something that Jesus hates. <laughs> whatever it was, is something that Jesus hates. And again, you go out and you look at what this doctrine of the Nicolaitans was, and there's a lot of different theories one theory is that it related to Nicholas, who was one of the believers who was ordained along with Paul in Acts 13 in Antioch. Then they say, well, this Nicholas guy, he fell to the wayside and people were following him. Another theory was that it was syncretism. What syncretism is, is a combination of Christianity and paganism. Well, I don't think that it was syncretism because that's what the doctrine of Balaam was. See? And Nicolaitan is something separate, right, from the Balaam. So it can't be the same thing. The third thing is what I think it is, and that is from the etymology of the word Nicolaitan, which is from Nikeo, which is to conquer or to be have victory, and Laos, 
people. It is to conquer the people. And it was the establishment of a clergy laity system where you couldn't do anything without the blessing of the bishop. And what does that do? That annuls the functioning of the individual members in the body. It hampers the body of Christ. It stifles the Christ in you. You see it? So it is where you couldn't do anything without the bishop. And what's very interesting is you have, um, and I always mix these two up, Irenaeus and Ignatius. These are two church fathers. I think it was Ignatius who was arrested and he was going on his way to Rome to be killed as a Christian and doing it triumphantly, whatever. And he was writing these letters and it was like in 107 AD when this occurred. And he said over 30 times in his letters to do what the bishop said. Don't do anything without the bishop. You couldn't hold a communion without the bishop. You couldn't have a Christian meal at your house without the bishop, without his consent. So what this is doing is it's setting up the clergy laity system where they it was another way of control. See? So this is all control. It's all control. So I think that's what was going on in this compromised church. That was the doctrine of the of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So Jesus says, verse 16, Repent, or I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with what? The sword of my mouth. Now, how is Jesus going to fight against these Nicolaitan guys and the Balaam guys with the sword of his mouth? How is Jesus going to do that? Well, is Jesus going to come down and do it? No, it would have to be the believers in the church, the ones that are... It's author agent, right? Yeah. Okay. Jesus is going to send agents to do it. And they're going to speak the word... And they're going to speak judgments. Isn't that something? You better repent or I'm going to send my agents to do it. All right? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Now, this is really something. I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Well, what is that? I, I didn't know. I didn't know what the hidden manna was. But the idea of hidden, and the, also the idea of every administration has had its own mysteries. Mm-hmm. All right? There were mysteries in the book of Proverbs. There's mysteries in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus talked about. And he said that the apostles, you you get to know these things because you have ears to hear. You're heeding and not just hearing and it goes clean, clear through. Mm-hmm. Right? Then we have the great mystery in our administration. These mysteries are not just little secret. They're big. They're things that have an influence on everything. Right? Well, I think that there are going to be deep truths in the time to come. And what's fascinating about this is this is what the adversary wanted. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah. We'll finish up here in just a few minutes we have left. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Now, it's addressed to the king of Babylon, but it's also talking to the adversary. Verse 4, that you should take up the proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. It's talking about the king of Babylon, but it's also talking about Lucifer. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. That's going to happen when the adversary is eliminated. Verse 8. 
Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no wood chopper is come up against us to thy cut us down. Verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirs up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like of us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and that's what did the adversary in. And the noise of thy boils, musical instruments, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, there it is literally, son of the morning, and how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend in the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. You know what the sides are? Oh, this Semitic imagery is excruciating. The word sides actually is the Hebrew word for thigh. Your leg. And the thigh is T-H-I-G-H. The thighs of the north. This is a double entendre. Because what is between your thighs? <laughs> a very secret, intimate part of your body. The adversary wanted the, the mysteries, the deep secrets of the north. He wanted all those great things that only God knows. But, what is he going to get? Look at verse 15. Yet thou shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pet. <laughs> the adversary, instead of instead of knowing the deep secrets of eternity, he is going to know the deep secrets of Gehenna. Wow. Oh, that's what I say. Excruciating. Can you imagine that? He wanted the hidden manna. <laughs> he wanted those deep secrets. And he is going to get the opposite. He's going to intimately know all the crevices of hell. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Instead, we, Jesus promises, we are going to know and receive the hidden manna. Instead of eating things on the idols, we are going to eat the hidden manna. Do you see that? Isn't that fascinating? Because see, the, the hope promises also apply to their situation. See, the whole allure of enchantment, of divination, of that kind of control where you can control your future or supposedly or you can control someone else's future by going to the soothsayer by going to the witch or the warlock and having the place a curse see all of these things are part of paganism they're part of the allure of paganism where you have that kind of control and so then you are privy to the secrets of the future. You eat of that. You know, you live off of that. You get your jollies from that, see? The opposite of that is what Jesus offers the faithful. You shall eat of the hidden manna. Wow. Oh, man. I mean, these, this is just really, it's so, it's so neat. Then, the second promise is, I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that received it. Uh, in one of the previous teachings I read from Polai's work about that, this was when if a man violated a woman that was he was not married to, there were several outcomes to that. The first one was they would be stoned. But 
if the man paid a fine, which was equivalent to the dowry to the father of the woman, then he would live. He would not be stoned. And they would take a white stone and they would put it in front of his tent or if he had a residence in his front yard and they would write his name on it. And in that culture, if I was the brother of the woman that was violated, I could do revenge against him. But if I was going to his tent with all these vengeful thoughts in my mind and I saw the white stone with his name written on it, that would prove that he was forgiven, he had paid the fine. Now in this context, here you have all of these people who have compromised the truth, and they have fallen under the influence of paganism. And now if they come to their senses, and if they repent, then they are going to be forgiven, and they're going to receive a white stone. And like I said, in the previous teaching, there's not going to be any old ladies in heaven saying, I remember what you did. So, because it wouldn't be heaven if that happened. If you, you know, if people remembered what you did forever, oh, that'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Yeah. You'd never live it down, right? Yeah. You'd never live it down. But. It'd be the size of the pit. Yeah, it'd be like the size of the pit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wow, but look at this. What a promise. What an incentive for people who have been compromised. Because, you know, sometimes if you've been compromised, you say, well, what the heck? I mean, I'm never going to win. I'm never going to outgrow this. I'm out. You know, I, you know right. And what would overcome that lie, that temptation? Right here. In heaven, all's going to be forgiven. See, on the stone is a new name. It's a new name. What is a name in their culture? It was something to live for. It was a reputation. It was a legacy. It was everything you've done. It was how people know you. We have, awaiting us, a new name. Not the old, old, same old, same old. Not the old man. The new man. Christ in us. In this context, now we understand how to deal with a compromised church. See? You can't wave your hand over that whole organization and say they're full of devil spirits. Sure, there are some working there, right? But even in the dead church, and this this compromised church was far from dead. It wasn't there yet. Okay, the adversary hadn't taken it down to other levels. Even in the dead church, Jesus said, there are some that have not soiled their garments, there are some that are still worthy, right? Even in the dead church. So, in the compromised church, there had to be more. So you can't wave your hand over that organization and be all hoity-toity or proud and, and say, well, I'm better than you. Because, you know, we don't have devil spirit. Well, wait a minute. There are spirits attacking all over the place. you got to stand on the word, right? And use that sharp two-edged sword. So we can come to those people now. And we know the prescription for them. The sharp sword. The true mysteries. The eternity with a new name. And help them to repent. Isn't that neat? I mean, I'm just astounded at how much is here in Revelation 2 and 3. It truly is Jesus talking to the church. And if we take an enlightened view of this, then we can be on his side and talk for him too, and speak for him, and walk for him, and help these people that need help. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the beauty of your word where all of these wonderful truths have been presented by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see his heart. We can see his love. We can see his care for the church. We can see like what he's doing in Ephesians, that it be without spot or blemish. Father, we thank you for our big brother. And we thank you for the truth of your word, that we can walk forth into the light as sons of God. Amen.